BNC, America's Black News Channel. Watch us on all major cable providers and major streaming platforms. Finally, news that speaks to us. Welcome back to Sharon's Table. Uh, we brought you this story yesterday. The wife of Justice Clarence Thomas admitting she attended the insurrection on January 6th. Well, the rally, she says, but <laughs> she says she left before the violence got underway. And so, Brittany, here, I saw her social media, but I want to ask you a question. What was she there for? Because on Twitter, I think it was, she talked about standing up and prayers. What, what do you think she was there for? She was there for tomfoolery and ridiculousness. Let us be clear about that. Um, this woman has been low-key an architect of uh, much of the conservative right-wing propaganda that we have seen, particularly over the last decade. Uh, and also, one of the things that, that becomes super interesting to me ab about all of this is the way that we're having a conversation, for instance, in the broader public about uh, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson's nomination and her qualifications. Mm -hmm. And here you have, between Jenny mm -hmm. Thomas and Clarence Thomas, two of the most unqualified people to be making these kind of power yes. moves in U.S. life to ever exist. Clarence Thomas was one of the least qualified Supreme Court justices that we'd seen in our lifetimes. He had uh, lower decision rates than anybody, body lower time serving on the bench, uh, his decisions weren't particularly sophisticated, and his interaction on the bench hasn't been particularly sophisticated. But let's also remember, if we're going to keep it real with our community, uh, Clarence Thomas was confirmed when I was a child, but he had overwhelming support for Black people, and he has become our enduring lesson in the idea that all the symbols aren't always the thing, right? And that we actually have to vet our own people. And so he is married oh. to a lunatic insurrectionist who, uh, who you know, supports... You know, every kind of conservative propaganda that we can imagine, every one of these right wing groups, he should absolutely be recusing himself from this. I wish he would recuse himself from the court entirely and permanently. We yes. know that's not going to happen because evil tends to just go and go and go. And I'm being not measured about this because. This is a woman, so here's the thing. It doesn't matter that she wasn't there when the violence started. She was one of the, the intellectual architects of the violence, which is to say, mm -hmm. she's not particularly intellectual, mm -hmm. but she was here giving money, uh, giving awards, uh, yep. these impact awards that she throws yep. to all of these conservative figures, right? Um, and so he needs to be off of most of the cases that he would perhaps hear on the docket this year because she is so uh, unethically con connected to so many different outfits. Yeah, I think it's very, very strange. And Candace, you know, it's not going to happen. Like Brittany said, <laughs> it's not going to happen. But just with your legal mind, should Clarence Thomas recuse himself mm -hmm. from these cases involving the former president, Donald Trump? Well, you know, this brings up a very interesting question that we've been talking about for years, and that is the fact that the Supreme Court does not have a code of ethics. Judges do on the lower levels. Attorneys do whenever they are in front and they, they they have to sit down and take a test about ethics, go all the way up to the Supreme Court. There is no ethics guideline. There are no rules that are in place. They do have to financially disclose what they are involved in. But when it comes down to it, he is actually following the rules. The problem is that we actually need to change those rules. But would it affect the mm. wife? Well, I want everybody to think about their last relationship. Do you want to be responsible for your uh, the last relationship's decisions that they make? I don't think it's fair to necessarily put that on your loved one or someone else that you happen to share uh, a life with, because you might have diff uh, different situations. You might have, uh, even though I think they are in one accord, how do we measure that and what type of precedent would that set? to say, well, your wife is doing this, and how far does it go? Your child is doing this. Your mom is doing this, because everybody has influence in your life. We can't make those decisions outside of it. But the bottom line is that these rules are not measured. These rules are not streamlined. Because, Sharon, there are no rules of ethics. So he is doing exactly what he is allowed to do so far. But those rules need to be changed, or rather, implemented. Having some types of ethics um, guidelines created for the United States Supreme Court of America. But Candace, can I can I jump well, I in don't and want to say be responsible? Go ahead, Brittany. Can I, 
Can I jump in and say, but we know that if Michelle Obama was out here doing all of these unethical things, that Barack Obama that wouldn't have been elected, right? That when Susan Rice was, you know, being being vetted for vice presidency, she has a son who is a rabid Trump supporter. And so that uh -huh. actually did change the calculations for her ability to be considered. And many folks have talked about, it's not just what your folks are doing, but also the appearance of this. Don't we get to hold public servants to a higher standard? And certainly don't we hold them to a higher standard when it's, when it's Black folks, right, who are seeking this position? You know, and I know we're talking about the Supreme Court next week, but the appearance of impropriety is going is a very sticky, sticky issue. And again, he's following the rules. You're right. There shouldn't be an appearance of impropriety, but the rules that are in place, he is following, which is why that we need why we need to why we need to change them. I mean, when Katanji yeah. Brown Jackson goes through a confirmation process, I hope that we don't hold something that her cousin or sister or former student does against her because it really has nothing to do with what she might do legally in that room. So you're right, though. The appearance of impropriety is unacceptable for attorneys and judges, but for the Supreme Court, it rides out, and he happens to be following the rules. You need to change them. Yeah, we do. And Amisha, so, you know, and what I was going to say is I don't want to be held responsible with some of the people that I perhaps, but I, I quit you if, I, if it's to this degree <laughs> and I don't, you know. Then we just we're not going to be together. I will divest of that relationship. Giselle said my Tommy can't you know catch and, and throw the football Jada and will at the red table talk. There's entanglements there. I just think when it comes to a wife, you know a spouse who's this vocal Amisha Maybe it is the appearance of impropriety that is everything when you talk about public trust but what what is your thought because there's long been this whole utterance that the court is not political and that's ridiculous and I wonder what his colleagues then again they've probably been looking a little side eye at him for many years now but what do his colleagues think about all of this and what does the Hill think and does it even matter I mean, the court has been political for quite some time. So I think that that notion in and of itself, um, of its early origins, is completely ridiculous. Because, again, we have to think about how these people are chosen. These are political appointees. Um, these are individuals who come with, in many cases, their own set of standards, their own set of goals. And in several, at least as of late, um, in terms of our past four presidencies, five, actually, we've seen people who have had political motivations and those who have actually served or have uh, made comments um, in, in regard to one political party or the next, uh, in addition to what I would consider a culture war. So that's not exactly new. But this is extremely problematic because Mrs. Clarence Thomas, this isn't her first rodeo of doing something crazy or something that was quite mm -hmm. questionable uh, to be the spouse of somebody who's on the court. She not only took part in um, being, being here uh, at the Capitol on January 6th and then saying that she magically disappeared in, in, in the wake of seeing things go sideways. But this is also a woman who actually helped to develop that narrative that got people to January 6th to begin with. This is an individual who was quite vocal about her push against, um, against uh, Joe Biden being elected president. This is someone who helped push the narrative around um, the, the, the votes being miscounted, someone who believed that there were stakes that needed to be recounted, even though we saw state after state push against and, and, and uphold the results of that election. This is someone who actually funded buses to get the crazy insurrectionists to D.C. So I, I think that there's so much there there that creates an, an extreme problem. But I think that to Candace's point, yes, there are people who are in multiple elected positions who have family members who've done some wild and crazy things. And I don't think those things should be held against them. But in this particular case, this is a woman who is in lockstep with her husband, who clearly has no problem with these issues, mm -hmm. who is sitting at the precipice of one of the most major decision-making processes that this nation will ever see, in particular as we're looking at the, you know, the, how we continue to investigate January 6th and what happens from there, including former President Trump's um, business in it and how he helped to create and infiltrate um, what would mm -hmm. have been basically a seizing of our democracy. I, I, I think that it matters here. Yeah. But I also think that we can't expect much because we have congressional leaders who are also there, Josh Hawley, fist pumping and living his best life, <laughs> meanwhile marching these people to mm -hmm. the Capitol, and nothing has happened and, to him and, either. So I honestly don't think we can expect yeah. much from a, from a group that has an ethics committee. We expect that from Congress because those mm -hmm. laws are in place, yet we still don't see anything happen. Yeah, that's true. And, and never mind this, okay, check the phone records. But, but check the phone records, and we're out of time, but I'm going to say this. First of all, you're all right and you're all brilliant, but it makes me wonder what else is there. 
if she did mm. all this and raised money and participated, who else does she speak to? Maybe someone down at mar lago when Clarence Thomas has professional conversations with his colleagues. When Clarence Thomas has conversations with his colleagues on the court, is that reported back? Maybe that's too far. Maybe I've gone too far, Candace, and I have no, you know, I'm trying to think of a legal term, basis or something you would say. But it makes me <laughs> wonder, and it makes me lack confidence. And I want the phone records, and I need you to report back to me, Candace, do some research. Can we get some phone records or something so I can see if she's talking to somebody down do what else said. and report information? <laughs> That's what I want. All right. the, the, exactly. I love you, ladies. Thank you, as always, for another edition of Sharon's Table. Um, it really is enlightening. You're the best. I'll see you next week. Much more start your day right after this.